We read in the book of Galatians of the fruit of the Spirit, and there are nine. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. We have been considering the fruit of the Spirit, each individual fruit of the fruit of the Spirit, and considering that these things being of the Spirit are truly divine, and that's part of the remarkableness of the fruit of the garden of our earth, that there would be divine things and divine fruit in our own lives and in our church and in churches over the length and breadth of this land. We've been considering as well that this fruit as well is something that we bear because we are in Christ, who is the vine, and we are the branches, and in that connection with Jesus Christ, we bear fruit, we live and we grow, so that the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit of Christ. One other thing we've been considering especially is that this fruit of the Spirit is a reflection of the virtues of God himself. So the very first fruit we have seen, love, is something that we show in our gardens in order to show something of the God who's love and the love of God. We want to, <clears throat> when we have been considering each of these fruits from the perspective of different texts in the Bible, because the Bible all itself reflects upon itself, and it's helpful for us to deal with a word or a concept like faithfulness as we do tonight by considering different passages of the Bible that address particular aspects of these different fruits. And so tonight I want to turn with you as we consider the fruit of faithfulness to a passage in the Old Testament, namely Lamentations, that speaks of the virtue of God himself, which is faithfulness. And we turn to Lamentations. Lamentations, one of those uh, books that's uh, maybe not so well known. It's uh, known as the book of the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. So these are lamentations or laments that he is inspired to write here. For all we know, Jeremiah had no converts in his day. A lot to lament about because the people of God were apostate and he was called to bring the word of God to them. That was his occupation and his calling as a prophet. But in this, in the Lamentations, and we're going to read at chapter 3, there's a remarkable statement here of the faithfulness of God. So Lamentations 3, let's read the first 24 or so verses and Jeremiah says here, I'm the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. And you think that starts out bad, it gets worse. He's led me and made me walk in darkness. He's talking of God and of God's wrath. He's led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he's turned his hand against me time and again, or time and time again throughout the day. He's aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He's besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. He set me in dark places like the dead of long ago. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He's made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He's blocked my ways with hewn stone. He's made my paths crooked. He's been to me a bear lying in wait like a lion in ambush. He's turned aside my ways and torn me to pieces. He's made me desolate. He's bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. The prophet is the target practice of God. He's caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I've become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day. He's filled me with bitterness and he's made me drink wormwood. He's also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You've moved my soul far from peace. You have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming. 
the wormwood and the gall, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. And now this, hear this especially, people of God, this I recall to my mind. Therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, or because of the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Thus far, we read God's word. Remarkable text, this, of the faithfulness of God. Remarkable because it seems to the prophet as if God is not faithful. And yet, that's what the prophet concludes at this point with. There's a statement here that everything's been taken away, and and worse than that, God seems to be against him, and his wrath is heavy upon him. God is like an archer shooting arrows at him, like a lion lying in wait, only to tear him to pieces. And so, in the midst of that, the statement of the faithfulness of God, and, and God is like that, is what we want to know, something vital for understanding of faithfulness as a fruit of the Spirit, the faithfulness of God. But there's something else here, and little recognized, I think. The psalmist here is speaking of the great faithfulness of God and the new mercies of God every morning, but little is spoken of the great faithfulness of the prophet. He speaks here of the great faithfulness of God, but there's something in the prophet that's able to see it and confess it. Now, of course, nothing in himself is saying this, but something prompted by the Spirit is moving Jeremiah to say these things and so to show that in his garden, even if it was a hole in the ground, there was the knowledge of God, and there was a child who, though God would slay him, was being faithful. We need this faithfulness this night, this day, in this season of life. We live in a very faithless age, and people have forgotten God, and they do not think he's faithful at all. What about God's people? Have we left off believing in times difficult and in times of fullness and and of plenty? Do we leave off God and being faithful to his praise? This is what this sermon is about, and it's a call to faithfulness in the faithful God. And so, under the theme of faith and faithfulness, with special deference to the text of Jeremiah in Lamentations 3, We want to consider the faithfulness of the Spirit, that fruit of the Spirit in our own gardens. And first of all, let us go, shall we, to the truth that's revealed here in Lamentations, the faithfulness of God. Anything about the faithfulness that God would produce in our gardens has to reflect God's own faithfulness or it's fake. And so we want to consider that faithfulness of the God who's in heaven and who's working on earth. Then secondly, we want to consider faithfulness in our gardens, in our life, in our commitments to one another, not only, but also in our allegiance to the word of God. And then we want to consider the fruit of the fruit of the fruit of this amazing fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of faithfulness. So for such a time as this, in our faithless age, for faithfulness, amongst us. Let's hear of this truth, the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is simply a virtue of God that goes along with his being God. The faithfulness of God is simply God being God and showing it in his words and in all that he does. He's faithful to what he's revealed himself to be. And so you can rely on this God. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to what he has revealed of himself in creation. He's faithful 
as he is revealed in so many ways. He's true to himself. And this is a great comfort to the people of God. Because if we had a God who couldn't be trusted, he wasn't faithful to what we thought we knew of him, then, of course, we would have no comfort. Maybe today we could trust in this God as revealed in a certain passage as this kind of a God, but tomorrow uh, we might be second-guessing if he's showing himself not to be faithful to what he's revealed in that passage or in our lives of himself. But the biblical truth is, God is always God. And whatever you truly know of God is true of God today, it was yesterday, and it shall be true tomorrow. Well, this is revealed in the Bible, this great truth of the faithful God. Here's, here's Lamentations. And the Bible says here, the Lord is one whose mercies are those which keep the prophet and keep the covenant people through the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed because his compassions, they fail not. And the psalmist says, or Jeremiah says, the compassions of God are new every morning. And so great is the faithfulness of God. So God, his faithfulness is not lamented there but celebrated in the midst of the lamentation. The psalmist in Psalm 36 is like unto this too, in a happier moment. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 36, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And what does that mean? It's stable, unchanging. And he says that's faithfulness. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. And note here what he's doing is recalling the virtues of God. They're as stable as the mountains, as high as the clouds, as unchanging as these things that we see, and then some because he's God. So that everything that God has revealed of himself is true, and it shall be true. This is his faithfulness. Besides that, he says, O Lord, you preserve man and beast how precious your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust. They trust in this faithful God under the shadow of his wings. They're abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. And so the Old Testament is speaking of the faithfulness of God, and the New Testament does not come short of the praises of God's faithfulness, to be sure, of which we'll speak presently. So that the word of God, you see, reveals this faithful God. This is the first thing we must know. If we are to be faithful to God and faithful to our trust, we must know that there's a God who is above and who's trustworthy. And the Bible reveals such a God. But now, I want to say this. Faithfulness is one of those attributes that's revealed, and it seems to be, it's revealed for us to know and to be comforted by in, well, in the nasty now and now, to use a phrase I use too much, in this hard life. Faithfulness is something that really shows itself to be a, a virtue when there's the temptation or maybe the tendency to back off of something because it gets too hard. The faithfulness of God is that virtue whereby he shows himself to be true, though every man be a liar. That's the idea. He's faithful, and even though it look like he's not, he's still faithful. And even though people are denouncing him, he's still faithful to himself, to his trust, and to his promises. And as we'll see, this is to be reflected in our own lives. And so this is this faithfulness revealed in the word of God. And it's revealed in all creation as well. The creation is a faithful representation of the faithful God, of the God who's creator, of the God who's not like the things he's created, but who is the God who speaks in his creation. And so that the heavens are great preachers. They declare the glory of God. They faithfully declare the truth of God's righteousness and justice and his faithfulness, his constancy, 
because they declare that he's the maker of all things. And so the providence of God, God provides, and this reveals that he's faithful to the creation that he has made. And, and this is to be understood here, and again, once again, in the face of the apparent denials of these things. Look at the psalmist, or I'm sorry, look at uh, the, the prophet Jeremiah. Everything is taken away. From the perspective of unbelief, you might think that God is not providing for Jeremiah, but Jeremiah sees through it and sees the ways of God in it and sees the wisdom of God. And he says, great is your faithfulness in spite of these things that I'm experiencing. Through them, you working faith in me and confidence in the faithful God. And so God is revealed in his word. He's revealed in creation and providence. And he's revealed especially, we know, in Jesus Christ. In the fullness of time and in the Old Testament prophets, in their witness of the truth, God is speaking of the truth of himself in Jesus. That's why Revelation, no less than three times, calls Jesus the faithful and true, the faithful witness of God. Why is he that? Exactly because he is the accurate representation of God, the true revelation of God in him dwelling all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is the faithful and true witness of God because to behold him is to behold the glory of God incarnate. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness of God because he is love come down to sinners and he is the one who will accomplish the, the revelation of the way of God in going to the cross. Jesus is the faithful witness that God will be God in saving sinners and his justice and his mercy will meet in that impossible place of revelation, but in that marvelous place of faithfulness, the cross of Calvary. You want to know the faithfulness of God? Go to Jesus and somehow receive the revelation that he went to hell where sinners like you like me. That's the faithfulness of God to himself, and the faithfulness of God to his promises, that I will be a God of a people, and they will be my people, and come what may, I'll be their God, and I'm going to be there until the end of time and beyond. And so Jesus Christ, and then there's, of course, the God who shows his faithfulness in his church, He's promised to his church to save his church. He indwells the church by his Holy Spirit, as we'll see presently. He shows, he reveals himself to be God in this thing called Sovereign Grace Church or Providence Church or whatever else church you go to, if it be a faithful church of God, it's God's faithful church. And God is showing himself to be the God of his people now in the New Testament age. So all of history is a revelation of the faithful God. Even though Genghis Khan may rule, or somebody else may rule, and somebody else and 5,000 other people may rule, God is in charge. And God is ruling over the good and over the evil. And he's causing his purposes to be revealed and realized, even as we speak, through this dynasty in the White House now, as it was in the last one. Through all things, good and evil, mighty and not, God is over all, showing himself faithful to his promise, to his purposes. And finally, we know God is faithful, as shall be revealed at the end of time. Sinner, do you know that God is faithful to his promise to slay sinners? And if you be yet in your sin and you be persisting in your sin and maybe persisting in your sin of resisting the word of the faithful God, right now as we speak, God will be faithful to his promise to reward sinners with the wages of sin, which is death. God is not fickle, you see, here. 
In sovereign justice, in strict justice, he will show himself faithful to himself, and he will not behold iniquity except to punish it. Yours too, though you may be so nice, and though you may be nice now and nicely religious listening in, though you haven't graced the door of a church in 30 years. If you be yet in your sins, God is faithful and just to reward you according to your iniquities and to cast you in hell forever. God is faithful. He is God. But he's also faithful to his promise to save sinners who trust in him. And this is our great delight. The faithfulness of God is revealed to us as the truth that God will be faithful to his word. And for all who've called upon him in this life, he will be their advocate And he will not look at them according to their iniquities only, but according to his mercies. And he will save them. And so the truth of history shall be vindicated, or God being vindicated, in the time when his Son comes in the clouds of glory and shows himself the faithful witness and true, and the judge on the behalf of God. Now this faithfulness is the truth of the Bible, of history, creation, of Jesus Christ centrally, of the church, and of all history. That's the truth. That's remarkable enough. It's also amazing. God has said, I will have faithfulness, my own, in gardens of my delight. I will have faith, And faithfulness, the word in the Greek for faithfulness or faith is really the same. One's a noun, one's an adjective. They go together. Believing and being faithful, they go together, as we'll see. But the point is this. What the apostle is doing here is he's saying there's fruit of the Spirit, Galatians. There's fruit of heaven. And in contrast to the works of darkness and the works of the flesh, which you should not have as a justified people of God, there's this fruit of the Spirit which is and which you should have. It's, you see, something that God gives and something that he cultivates and something that is our responsibility to have as well. All of those things. Now, this is an amazing thing, isn't it? Because we live in such a barren world, and as Jesus says, when he returns again, shall the Son of Man find faith in the earth? That's in his last day's discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 18. When the Son of Man returns at the end of time and he's going to judge the living and the dead, shall he find faith and therefore faithfulness on the earth? You see, Jesus is looking ahead. Way back 2,000 years ago, he's looking again to 2017, March 12. The day in which we live, today. When nobody's believing in God, hardly. Now that's not surprising, Jesus has said. It's going to be just about faithless, the end of time. As in the days of Noah. We read in 2 Timothy 3, I believe, that perilous times will come. And there's 19 vices that are listed among them all. You can read that. Perilous times, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 19 children, that's a lot of vices, bad things. And the first and just about the last... Tell us why there's faithlessness on the earth. There's no faith in the earth, just about. No faithfulness either. The first vice is men will be lovers of themselves. And about the 18th vice is that men will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So as bookends in this terrible uh, display of vices... Lovers of pleasures, lovers of self, rather than lovers of God. No wonder there's faithlessness. There's no faithfulness. There's no faith. 
People, you see, when they love themselves, believe in themselves or believe in nothing. And they say, that's our prerogative. I don't have to believe in God. And I used to be religious and God let me down because he didn't give me the car that I wanted. Or I was sick and laid up for so long and I, and I, life has passed me by and it's just not right. God hasn't dealt me the right cards. I don't believe in God. He hasn't come through. You see, this world is a world that doesn't believe in God or in a faithful God. They believe in something like fate, maybe, or evolution, maybe, whatever, maybe, Big Bang, maybe, but not God. And therefore, it's a free-for-all as far as what's right, and what's honorable, and what's worth sticking to. And therefore, fickleness. So I got fate, I got free-for-all, and I got fickleness. Tie them all together in your brains, will you? That leads to faithlessness. That is faithlessness. If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe there's anyone worth believing in and sticking to any cause that's honorable forever, which might not mean that you should just leave it and stop halfway through your commitment to it, that leads to fickleness. That explains why marriage is so destroyed today. There's no faithful spouses. Because, you see, people don't believe it's an institution of God anymore. It's an institution of man, convenience. Actually, it's outdated. It's not very convenient, so we won't even get married. But if we do, I vow with prenuptials, agreements and conditions that have to be fulfilled for me to be faithful to my vow. And you vow the same thing, and that's a mutual arrangement here. That explains why there's so many breakups and so many people that just shack up and don't marry. It explains why there's faithlessness in churches. It explains why people don't really understand friendship anymore, and they don't certainly understand the friendship that says, I will die for you, or the love that says, I will die for you, because I'm faithful to my, my commitment to you. In this barren world, there is, however, a garden. It's amazing the garden of God, your heart and mine. If you be God's, there's the beginning of faithfulness, which is this, the response to God's own faithfulness to his promise, which makes you committed to him. That's basically what faithfulness is, the response, the Holy Spirit working it in you, to God's own love and faithfulness and forgiveness and all the blessings he's given so that you're faithful and committed to him. That's what faithfulness is. And that is in you and in me if we be believers. It's in every child of God. Note the fruit of the Spirit is not just the fruit of the Spirit in super Christians or super faithful people. The fruit of the Spirit is in the fruit of the garden of every heart that is God's own heart, that is after God's own heart. The fruit of the Spirit is in every church that's a true church of Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit is in every rich man, poor man, and beggar man and thief, saved by the blood of Jesus and indwelt by the precious Spirit. He pours out, you see, God would show his faithfulness in you in a big way, in a Christ-like way, so that the first response, the first fruit of faithfulness is this. I love God and what he says. What does God say? Jesus. That's the word of God. I love Jesus. Faithfulness is my commitment to Jesus is to my following him wherever he leads. The sheep hear his voice. 
He knows them. They follow him. They follow. Wherever he goes, wherever he goes. They listen to the words of Jesus in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the inspired word of God. They're committed to that, to the inspiration of the Holy Scripture, to the doctrines that are there, to the faith of our fathers living still. They will be faithful. They will be committed. The church that bears the fruit of this commitment to Christ will preach him and will be unadulterated in its gospel preaching. Pure will be the milk of the word with no add-ons and complete confidence in the power of the plain gospel preaching. To work faith now among all God's children. The power of the sacraments to confirm the faith that's worked by the preaching. So we believe in the ordinances and we're committed to the church of Jesus Christ. This is an aspect of the faithfulness in the garden of the fruits that, uh, of the Spirit that is all but neglected nowadays. The theology seems to be let go and let God and here we go and the next roller coaster ride in the worship services down the road or wherever you find popular evangelistic sort of churches. Faithfulness is faithfulness to the means that God gives us, to the ordinary things on the earth, to the God who's revealed himself in ordinary flesh like Jesus Christ's flesh, God incarnate with no form that we should desire him. Well, he's also revealed in his church with no form that anyone should desire it. And that's as it should be that we may show the world something beyond with the word that we have and, and with the ministry that we have and with the outreach that is not something that compromises though it be lively preaching and the preaching of a person with personality. We don't want a puppeteer or a gamester or a comedian or anything to take away from the God who is God. See, faithfulness shows itself in that, and it shows itself in those basic ways responding to the true God who saved us truly and who's faithful to us and with regard to his providences. And so with Jeremiah, we say these things, they, they may come upon us and we may even, even have to drink and to eat wormwood and gall, whatever that is, it doesn't sound good. But the idea is that things that don't sound good are prophesied as going to happen to all who will live godly in Christ Jesus. Are you ready for that? And are you ready in your lamentations, in your lamentable a situation because you've sought righteousness and, and you've been rewarded with mockery. Are you ready to say in the middle of a lamentable situation, God nevertheless is faithful. And great is his faithfulness. Yes, great. In it all. Have you had an experience like that lately? Hard things. And you can see they just had to be. They had to be. If this happened to you, that God worked in all things and it happened to you, a hard thing. Maybe years ago, faithfulness says, I don't give up on God. In fact, I say his mercies are new every morning. Especially when I woke up and it was the darkest night and the, the stormiest night and, and I woke up and even then and the last memory I had was hurt and breakup and, and sickness and death and diagnosis of cancer, whatever I had. And I wake up and I can say, ah, mercies, mercies. 
abundant mercies. And I can wake up and carry on and praise God this morning, this day. That's what faithfulness shows itself to be. And of course, it shows itself in a life of godliness, though it be a cross that we bear and though we have to be, as we heard this morning, just servants. And we don't get to be the king of the hill. We don't want to be the king of the hill or the queen of the hill. Just lowly servants. That's the lot of the child of God. Bearing a cross and denying self, and everyone wants to assert himself and herself and itself and, and their rights and all of these things, and they seem to be pushing themselves in, and you don't even get a piece of the pie of this world. And there, you're saying, that doesn't matter. I just want to obey God. And they're eating and drinking and being merry and, and I'm fasting and I'm thirsty and I'm not so happy just pounding a nail day after day and, and not taking the job that would cause me to compromise and, and just doing what God calls me to do. And that's all right. If you're a student, faithful student. Teacher, faithful teacher. And on and on. And then faithful, of course, to one another. Faithfulness in the gardens of faithfulness is faithfulness to one another. There's this parallel passage we've been considering in 1 Corinthians 13. Love believes all things and so on. Love is brought out, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13. But love, also in Galatians, is the primary virtue we've seen, and it shows itself in being faithful to one another. Now, of course, that's in marriage. And sadly, a lot of us set ourselves up to be tempted not to be faithful when we don't marry correctly. We just engage in all kinds of stuff, and we don't get married correctly. But when we're married, faithfulness is so vital to marriage. Faithful husbands, faithful wives. Are we? Are we? Faithful to our trust. Men, to lead our wives to heaven. Do you know that's what Ephesians calls us to do? If you're a faithful man, lead your wife to heaven. Don't drag her there. And she's not to go there as your servant, as the one whom you used all your life, but as your friend and as a child of the Father. You lay down your life for her. You, you, you're engaged on the behalf of the Holy Spirit in the sanctification of her by reading the Bible to her and, and actually having more time for it than for the sports page, the Word of God, and bringing that to her and talking about that wonderful Word with her and what life together is all about and ought to be. And then, of course, you're faithful, your wives, and honoring your husbands and, and doing the lovely things that you do for us men to, to remind us that God is good when we're not worthy. We're not worthy. And then you raise your children by precept and example. That's faithfulness. And children, you're faithful. Oh, you're faithful. But that leads me to my final point, the fruit of this. I'm just going to speak of a few things here and let you go. The fruit of faithfulness in, in a church, in a home, is seen in, a, in amazing ways in, 
and children. When children come to Christ and they say, I love Jesus, when they show that they're real children of God, that's an amazing sign of the faithfulness of God now at work in those little ones and those teenagers and those young people and their faithfulness now to him. The, the covenant has been perpetuated by the grace of God when that is seen. And it's, it's really a remarkable thing. And there's a calling here for young people and, and you young ones here. And I'm glad you're here tonight. Faithfulness is this gift and faithfulness is this calling. And, and what are you? What are you doing now with regard to your baptism? Most of you, I suppose, have been baptized when you were infants. We believe in God's promises in the generations. But how are we faithful to that baptism which signified and sealed that we were not our own, but we belong to Jesus? Faithfulness in the children and the young people is a response, and it is to say, I'm not going to fool around and wait to become an adult and maybe more responsible than to be more responsible. Now is the time. Now is the time to say, I'm not going to just fool around and go the way of the world. And when I go to college, it's not just to have a good old time and, and to do my own thing and to get rich and so on. I'm going to be a faithful child of God. And I've been given these talents and this mind, and I know you have. And I'm going to be found faithful in them, whatever it is. And I'm going to choose a mate and choose a way of marrying that is honorable to God. And, and, and I'm going to be faithful all the way to the altar. And I'm going to be faithful to my vows and, and see how important it is. And when it's seen, then, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. Another thing about faithfulness in the church. You know what happens when there's a people of God that's Responding to the faithfulness of God in the church, it's this. Now, this may be a little hard to explain, hard to receive, but it's something like this. We're in a church full of sinners, and God is faithful to forgive and to bless sinners here. When faithfulness is worked in each of us, we start to behold God in one another. We start not to judge these people that are next to us or across the aisle or that have problems and we don't. But we start to love them and actually to believe in God in them. Bear with me. Psychologists might call this the love that believes in persons. Well, I don't want to call it that so much, but faithfulness worked by love does, however, believe in God in per persons. And therefore, it encourages people. And that's the fruit of faithfulness in a congregation. We are encouragers. And though, yes, I know there's a sinful pa uh, pastor on the pulpit here, and look at him now, he's just stammering these things, and I'm not sure, so sure I get it yet. I believe in God in that pastor. I believe in the heart of God in that pastor. And I believe... That God uses the weakest of means to accomplish his will, and he's working in him to say a word that I need to hear about love and kindness and being faithful my, to my commitment, as God is to love sinners where they're at. That's how God shows his faithfulness here. He loves sinners where they're at. Now, he leads them up and up and up and up. But he doesn't abandon his work when he finds that the sinners aren't so perfect. And nor do we ever. So true of elders, so true of deacons, so true of a pastor, so true of every single one of us. Believe in God in persons who confess Christ. 
Don't be stuck on their peculiarities, as one has put it, but believe in the possibilities that are in that person who confesses Jesus Christ and who stumbles like you do, and yet who is someone who's real and wanting more and more to be consistent, and yet he doesn't just have it all together, does he? Nor does she, and she's not the the best wife, and he's not the best man, and, and all of these things. However, this is how God works. And in congregations, the fruit is wonderful. Without it, we're always suspicious of one another. We're always looking down the nose at one another. We're always, we're over here, and they're over there. And the well, I'll say it this way. The fat people are over there. The skinny people are over there. The perfect people, well, they're where I sit. May it not be so. If there is the faithful God in this congregation, may it be that we're faithful to our pledge, to our commitment, to the God who loves sinners like me. I'm the chief. And who wants to show his own love in me loving the unlovable. You too. So it's not, you see, just about showing up on time and, and yes, some outwardly faithful, but it's about this love, this dynamo, this power that comes from we who have been to the cross of Calvary. And we who have had to endure temptations, but we believe the promise that God in the midst of temptations, who is faithful, will not let us be tempted above we are able. And we, in the midst of the suffering, we're believing the God who is faithful and who says, trust in me, because I'll deliver you out of them all. Now, that's faithfulness. That's a few words that have been stammered about faithfulness. It starts with God in the gardens for fruit. People of God, loved ones, bear much fruit also the fruit of faithfulness. Amen. Lord God, we pray that you would bless us. Make your face to shine upon us and grant your spirit that we may be faithful and more faithful and more loving and more your garden. Oh, Father, the barrenness and the weeds and the hardness and the clods of this world are so and too much in our lives. Cultivate, Lord, us. Work in our hearts tonight. Maybe there's some, maybe all, who've really needed to hear this word. I have, Lord, and I trust you will show yourself faithful to your promises, to your grace, to work in us to be fruitful. Lord, may we go on our way and tonight sing the praises of God together. May we rejoice in your goodness, your steadfastness, and that also seen in our hearts and lives. For Christ's sake, amen. Great is thy faithfulness is our last hymn, 408. <clears throat> Let's sing stanzas one and three of 408.
want to remind everyone of the singing in of the spring tonight that will take place officially at the Dick's home after the service, and we're glad to have everyone and anyone over who wants to sing the praises of God and to enjoy good refreshment and fellowship together. So that afterwards, after the benediction, we'll be singing from number 36 in the bulletin. Receive now God's parting blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Amen. Thank you. 